I'm Bob Wisniewski, your workers' compensation lawyer. It's now time to talk to you about permanent disability in your workers' compensation case. In Arizona, there are two types of permanent disability. One type is called scheduled injury, and the other one is called an unscheduled injury. A scheduled injury is, in layman's terms, an arm, a leg, an eye. A scheduled injury pays a certain percentage of your workers' compensation average monthly wage for a certain period of time. For example, if your doctor has given you a specific numerical rating out of a medical book called the American Association Guideline to Rating Permanent Disability, and the doctor says you have a 10% disability, let's say, in your knee, you will get 10% of the benefits that a person would get if they lost their knee entirely, lost their leg entirely. That would be a 100% disability. And in that case, you would receive compensation for 60 months, and it would be a percentage of your workers' compensation average monthly wage. Remember, it is the wage set in your workers' compensation case, not what you had been earning uh, in your work before you were hurt. It is the wage that you are presently receiving two-thirds of. That is the average monthly wage, and you receive two-thirds of that when you have been on workers' compensation. Uh, temporary total disability benefits and temporary partial, assuming there were no other earnings. But let me get to how the scheduled works. You have that knee injury, the doctor gives you a 10%, and then that permanent impairment translates to 10% of the 60 months, which comes out as six months for in this example. They take your average monthly wage, and if you can return back to each and every element of the job that you had the day you were hurt, you receive half of those workers' compensation uh, wage for the six months. Let's say that your compensation wage was $2,000. Then you would receive $1,000, half of that, if you could return back to work for those six months that the doctor gave you the 10% impairment on your leg. On the other hand, if you can't return back to each and every element of the job, then you receive 75% of your average monthly wage for those same six months, again, assuming the 10% impairment to the knee. Uh, they would take the $2,000, take 75% of that, and you would be paid each month for the six months that would be on that schedule. And they call it a schedule because it comes out of a law book and it is part of a law. There's a scheduled injury for eyes, teeth, hands, arms, legs, toes, that is the scheduled injury. The next part is unscheduled, and an unscheduled injury is whether or not you have permanent impairment to your torso, to your body, to your shoulder, to your hip. Those are called unscheduled disabilities, and that's the second kind of permanent impairment that you have in, in Arizona. What happens in those cases is they take that average monthly wage for workers' compensation purposes, they take the percentage of impairment that the doctor gives you, but the percentage of impairment doesn't translate into dollars as the scheduled impairment does directly. What happens on the permanent impairment on the unscheduled, the doctor gives you work restrictions. No lifting, no bending over certain uh, times a day, certain poundage, sedentary work, no overhead work, for example, if it's a shoulder injury, no climbing ladders, if it's, a, if it's a, a back injury and things of that nature where there's safety problems. So those restrictions combine with the percentage of impairment. And then the question is, can you earn your workers' compensation comp wage? In my prior example, I used the wage of $2,000. Well, what would happen in this situation is let's say that you are a truck driver and you can no longer drive the truck and unload the truck because of your percentage of impairment and the restrictions that your doctor put on you. But you could be the dispatcher, for example, in that company or any other company and you could earn, let's say in my example, $1,000 then the $1,000 is subtracted from the average monthly wage of the $2,000 and they pay you 55% of the difference. But they pay that difference for as long as you live, not just your work life, 
assuming you have no greater earnings than what I've just described in, described in this example. Each year, the insurance company will send you a form where you have to accurately report your income in the prior year. If, for example, the wage was established, the earning ability was established on that dispatcher job at $1,000, and you earn $1,500 in the next year, the insurance company can ask to have your award changed or rearranged and reduced because your earning ability has gone up. So unscheduled disabilities and, and unscheduled impairments and unscheduled disabilities are way different than scheduled. You may get less money each month than you would in a scheduled, but you have the potentiality of getting them for a longer period of time than a scheduled because there is no limitation on the number of months in an unscheduled disability. In unscheduled disability, you will be required to go look for work consistent with your limitations. Just like you did perhaps if you were on temporary partial disability and you had to fill out monthly status report forms. I will require you to keep a log and a list of where you go look for work. You should be very complete. Pick up business cards. If you look on the internet, please print out whatever forms you uh, apply whatever information you determine. If you're looking for a particular company and it has the name and address and you're making an application on the internet, print out the, the page from the internet of the name of the company and make some notes on it that you sent in an application. Then follow up on it. You may have to go back to that same employer a month or two later and see if they have any further openings. So on an unscheduled disability, you again must look for work on a very consistent basis and document it. It is very, very critical. The judges want to see good faith, conscientious uh, searches for work. It just can't be something that you fool around with or you fake up. This is very important. You must go everywhere. Again, do it consistent with your limitations and your training. For example, if your doctor tells you that you can't do any lifting or bending, then don't look for jobs that require construction or labor work. Look for work that is sit-down. Uh, if it requires a language ability to speak a foreign language, then don't look for the job that says we only want bilingual Spanish receptionists, for example. Look for work in places that you really think you'll be able to find work. Look in the newspapers. Look on the internet, ask around, ask your friends, go back to your prior employer and see if they will hire you. And you have to document, document all those job searches because the industrial commission will ask you about them, the other lawyer for the insurance company will ask you about them, and the judge will ask you about them. So you must have a lot of jobs and a lot of searches. Uh, this is not where you will just do one or two or three like you did when perhaps when you were on temporary partial disability and filled out in those monthly status report forms and you were only required to do three a month. You will have to do much more than that and I will require you to do that because you must meet the legal obligations of a conscientious good faith search for work. Document it, the number of the, the place you go, the street address, the name of the individual you talk to, whether or not they gave you an application, whether they gave you an interview, you must document and document those because those are essentially the items of evidence that we will use if we ever go to a hearing in this matter. We will hire an expert that will assist us in determining what jobs uh, can be available to you given your limitations. But that expert also will rely upon your job searches and we will also give you a copy of the, the other side's experts list of where they believe there's jobs. In that case, I'm going to require you to go to every one of those jobs, or at least make a contact with them by the telephone, and find out if that job really is a valid job, a true job that meets the requirements of your limitations, and it represents what their other expert has said. You will find at times that some of those jobs aren't even available. You'll go to the place and find out that it's an empty building or you call the number and the number is uh, disconnected. Or you will call the number and they'll say, no, we never uh, hired anybody in the last six months. Um, and we never hired them at the rate that that piece of paper says those jobs are paying. Then I want you to write that down because that's information that I can use when I cross-examine the other side's expert. So it's going to be very, very important for you to search for work 
document it and bring those documentations to my office. Now let me give you one other reminder. If we go to a hearing, the judge will require me to give him all of the paperwork on the case 30 days before the hearing. So if you have job search forms, you can't waltz into my office on the day of the hearing and give them to me because it will be too late to, for them to be considered in evidence. So I'm going to ask you to give them to me on a regular basis. We'll have several months before the hearing. I want you to bring them in almost weekly to my office or mail them in so I can submit them to the judge. Certainly, a month before the hearing, I have to really give the judge everything that I have in my possession and that you have about job search forms. That doesn't mean that you stop looking for work in that last month because I'll be able to at least ask you about those when you go to the hearing. But it's very important that I have all of the prior job searches and not wait till the last minute and give them to me a couple of days before the hearing. That's pretty much how the two types of permanent impairment work in Arizona. You'll get one other type of benefit when you go to a permanent disability, and that's supportive medical care. That means you'll get an allowance for medical care of two or three visits a year, an elbow brace, a knee brace, a back brace, some medicine. It's very, very important that you continue to go to your doctor and use your supportive care award. First of all, it's important to your health. Secondly, it's important to document that you are going to your doctor and you must go regularly on this allowance essentially. It's a maintenance program and as you get to the end of whatever that allowance is, one year or two years, please ask your doctor to continue it if he believes it needs to be continued. Your doctor can increase it um, and he may think that you need more visits or perhaps more assistive devices, more medicine, uh, those are important features that he needs to write down and get that to me before that period expires so I can extend your supportive care for the next year and the year after that. If at any point in time your doctor says after uh, documenting that you've been going to him for some time that your condition has worsened so much and it's gone downhill and it's time now to do some more surgery or do some more active care on you, then I need a report from that doctor so I can file for a petition to reopen your case. So that's very important. And likewise, if I get you a permanent award on a unscheduled claim, remember to keep copies of any and all earning statements that you have in the future. If you are working, any kind of documentation, if you're earning cash, please write it on a calendar because it's very important that we have those records in the event that there's a controversy in the future about your documentation and your earning ability. Remember, if your earning ability falls down because of your limitations, then we can go back just like the insurance company can and rearrange or change your permanent award. They want to change it down. We want to change it up because perhaps your doctor has given you greater restrictions now. But let us know that information. If you receive papers from your doctors, bring them to my office. The doctors don't typically send us the reports of your visits to the doctor unless we ask for them. Um, these seem like complicated topics, but they're very important. If you have questions about your permanent impairment, how permanent disability is calculated, then I would really ask you to consult with my office because there are certain unusual complex legal cases. Let's say that you have a scheduled injury on one side and a scheduled injury on the other side that doesn't make it scheduled, it makes it unscheduled. There's also complications if you've had prior industrial injuries in this state or other states that gave you permanent impairment. That has another legal impact on how we look at your case. So you need to be, provide me with that information and then we'll talk about how the case would be handled. But in any event, you know that you have the opportunity to call me at any time, call any one of my assistants, we'll get you in, we'll explain this to you, and I think the questions in, can be answered uh, adequately by looking at this video, but certainly if you have any problems, you know you can call Bob Wisniewski at 602-234-3700 or 1-800-224-3220 statewide in Arizona. Thank you very much.